Next, we are going to look at a even more generalized version of the Hooke's law, right? So until now, we have looked at the generalized version of Hooke's law for a for a body which is under a state of this triaxial state of stress. You have the sigmas, you know, sigma x, sigma y, and sigma z, right? No shear. So what we are going to look at next is that how does the Hooke's law change, right? Or what are some of the additional components which gets incorporated when we also have shear along with the axial loading which we had looked at before, right? Now, coming back again, revisiting to what we have looked at before we go ahead and include the shear is that we had looked at this one, right? For in the case where we just have only the axial loading we had seen and if you remember that these formulas you know although they look slightly complicated they are actually quite easy to derive once you get a hang of it once you write it out a couple of times and more importantly you understand that how they are being derived right so once you write it out write it out a few times and you will see it slowly you know gets into your system that how these different values of the strains which are coming over here right so if you recall we had applied the the principle of superposition where we had broken up this one into a cube which has which just has sigma x and sigma y and sigma z and eventually we derived this set of expressions over here for the normal strains right now what is going to happen at the towards the end of this lecture you will see that uh, i am going to throw at you a lot more equations in addition to these ones which you have over here but again as i said once you understand how they are derived it's very easy to get a hang of things of of, of how the strains or the stresses come out as right now now why do we need to consider in addition to these axial loadings why do we need to consider shear right the short answer to that is any body, any, any particular body that you are looking at over here, right? If I am subjecting, you know, in, in, a, in a particular configuration, if I am subjecting it to, to, you know, different kinds of loads or the forces and so on. And if you take a small element within this particular body, it need not only have the axial loads. It will have the very general state of stresses where it will have the sigma x's, the sigma y's, the sigma z, it will have the shear across all the different faces and so on. So that is the most generalized state of stress that you can have, right? What I'm looking at is something like this. If you have a body on which is subjected to, you know, different kinds of loadings, P1, P2, P3, P4, it may have, you know, its own self-weight, it can have some distributed loads over here on the surface, it can have loads which is distributed across the entire volume and so on. And if I take uh, this body and if I, you know, cut a section, say, which is, you know, normal to this X direction over here, you are going to see the sigma X, tau X, Y, tau X, Z, for the same point, if I, you know, cut another cross section over here, you are going to see, you know, uh, the, the sigma x tau y x and so the tau a x y and the tau x z and so on. So for the same point, if you take any point within this particular body over here, you are going to see these all these different state of stresses which are there right so this is the state of stress at any point inside so remember initially earlier we had only looked at my sigma x my sigma y my sigma z right now remember here there are the equal and opposite sigma x equal and opposite sigma y is just not shown in this particular figure right now in addition to that what we are going to look at now is that what is this tau x y tau x z right tau y z tau z x and the uh, you know the different taus which are which are here which which are acting in this particular member now remember one thing that what we had derived remember that when we are looking at in in the uh, the, the concept of stresses and strains when we are looking at that particular topic that we saw that the taus which are which are occurring in these you know mutually orthogonal faces over here when you are looking at a particular plane they are equal right that is essentially tau x y is essentially tau you know y x tau y z equals to tau z y and so on. So what I was hinting at is that if you have this particular cube as you see over here so you know this is my tau over here and this is my tau over here and if i'm looking at this cube in you know this uh, particular diagram over here i have this tau 
so this is the tau y of x and why is it y of x because it generates in the plane over here which is perpendicular to the y axis and it acts along the x direction see this one is generated on the plane which is on the which is the perpendicular to which is in the y but it acts along this particular x axis that you see over here that is that's why this is called tau y of x if this is not clear i will probably you know, write this slightly bigger so this is tau y of x right similarly this one is called tau x of y and why is it called that because this one generates on the plane to which the normal is the positive x the normal to this one is along the positive x and the stress the shear by itself acts along the positive y direction over here so this particular guy is tau x the first subscript is the along that normal plane so the normal to this face is this x direction over here and the second subscript y is the direction along which the shear is acting which is the positive y direction over here right now remember that for this one what we had derived that this and this this tau must be equal over here to maintain equilibrium of that element right and to maintain for the balancing of the moments and so on so what this essentially means is that my tau x y must be equals to tau y x right now going back to my basic relationship between tau and the corresponding strain tau is the shear stress the corresponding strain gamma which is produces over here right now remember if this is called tau x y so the gamma is so, so the gamma is going to be called gamma x y and do you remember the relationship between the shear stress and the shear strain it is going to be tau x y equals to g gamma x y we had looked at this one over here right so this was along the x y now let's look at the other direction so if you have a tau y z and a tau y z this is tau z y but you know and now we know they are going to be equal right tau y z and tau y z over here remember for this one if you are going to consider the you know the angle of deformation right you have the gamma x y over here here the angle of deformation is going to be your gamma y z right so in this one if i have to write it is simply going to be my tau y z will be equals to g gamma y z right similarly for the last one which is tau z x i am going to have my tau zx will be equals to g times gamma zx or xz it's one and the same thing over here right so what we just did was that we wrote the expression for the stresses so the expression for the strains is simply going to be gamma xy will be tau xy by g right here gamma yz will be equals to tau yz by g and in this one gamma zx will be tau zx by g simple right so let's go back to the generalized state of stress this was our generalized state of stress that had both the axial as well as the shear it has the sigma x's sigma y's and the sigma z it has the tau x y's the tau x z and the tau y z right so for the axial strains we had written the relationships of your epsilon x epsilon y epsilon z right and in the last page we wrote the relationship between my gamma xy gamma yz gamma zx right so if i just have to expand a couple of them over here remember my epsilon x was equals to a positive of sigma x over e right minus nu sigma y by e minus of nu sigma z divided by e and so on and so forth for the other ones and my gamma xy here was equals to tau xy by g 
right you can go ahead and you know fill in for you know the epsilon y and the epsilon z and here for the gamma xy and the gamma xz right once we have all of these strains over here and remember one important thing your normal strain that is my epsilon x does not have the relation with gamma xy take a look at these two guys they are completely independent they, they depend upon you know separate things different things right so if i have to take this generalized state of stress over here right and for this generalized state of stress if i have to write the generalized state of strain right how does that look like it looks something like this over here right as i said i'm going to throw in a lot of formulas at your face but now you know how to get them now you know what is the basis of these formulas the first ones the first set of formulas that you see over here are the actual strains which we just derived right the second set of formulas that you have over here are the shear strains remember the gamma is equal to tau xy divided by g gamma xz equals to tau xz divided by g gamma yz equals to tau yz divided by g right and all of these relate to this generalized state of stress over here right now that you have these strains you can do some mathematical jugglery you can cancel out terms you can you know, separate out variables to get the corresponding stresses right so this is essentially the transformation that we are doing from the strains to the stresses that we have over here right from these expressions you can derive the expressions for sigma x sigma y sigma z tau xy tau yz and the tau zx over here this is not particularly important for now what is more intuitive and easier to remember uh, easier to derive are these epsilons over here once you have these you can easily derive these particular numbers that are there over here right so now that we have this generalized state of stress and the corresponding strains in a particular element or a particular structure next we are going to look at a particular application example